wait till I get to you before you introduce yourself. And he says, that way I can cut in and get a close up of your mug so your mother can see who you are. <laughs> you know? <And> so, <laughs> Welcome, friends and fans, to another edition of GalaxyCon Live, where we are bringing the convention experience directly to you. Our guest today is an actor whose body of work includes Adam-12, Predator 2, Farscape, and the highly undervalued Airplane 2, the sequel, and so much more. Today he joins us to discuss this fantastic career. Please welcome Mr. Kent McCord. Hey, how are you doing? <laughs> good, Kent. How are you doing? I'm good, thank you. That, uh, was, a, that was a nice... Uh, the run into it, uh, see old friends and everything, and uh, see Shatner there. We worked <laughs> on Airplane Two together. Yes, and, uh, you know, and then and then also when I was doing the Adventures of Ozzy and Harriet, we moved over to Culver City at Desi Lou Culver uh, mm -hmm. on, for the last season of the show, the fourteenth and final season of the Adventures of Ozzy and Harriet. And next to us was this new show that was coming on called something like Star Trek or something like that. Hmm. And I uh, wonder whatever happened to that. I know. I, you know, it shows up in the old, uh, you know, cult TV books occasionally, you know, yeah. it's considered yeah. a curiosity. I've seen a couple episodes. It's charming. Yes. Yes, it is. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, Kent, uh, well, thank you for joining us here on the GalaxyCon virtual stage. Our team is going through the chat room right now, pulling out the questions. In the meantime, I, I just throw this out. I do this every time I get a, a solo one-on-one -on -one guest uh, like this. What got you interested in becoming an actor? Well, you know, it's funny. When I look back, I just had an uh, interview with somebody, and I said, I actually, when I was about eight years old, appeared on television for the first time, and it was at a television station at the University of Southern California. But that wasn't what spurred me on to becoming an actor. I was uh, uh, playing football. I was a college student, freshman, just finished my freshman football season, uh, at a community college out here in, in Southern California called Citrus. Uh, family that I was living with, their son was at UCLA in a, in a member of the Phi Psi fraternity, which at UCLA is the jock house. And, yeah. and, uh, <laughs> and, and Mike had come home one weekend and he said, you know, we're going to play a touch football game. Uh, are you interested? And I said, uh, yeah, what, you know, and he said, it's going to be, uh, Ricky Nelson's team, and we're going to play a team that Elvis Presley has. And I said to Mike, oh, yeah, Mike, let me know when that happens. And a couple of weeks later, Mike came home from UCLA, and he said, you know the game we were talking about? We're going to play tomorrow, but tonight we're going to drive into Hollywood and meet with Rick and talk about the game and drop some plans and stuff like that. Sure. And sure enough, we drove in 30 miles from where – I was living in the Hollywood, went to Rick's house. The next day, we, a group of us met at the Fisai house at UCLA and caravaned over to a little park. And those of you who have Google Earth or Google Maps or anything can look this up. It's a little park called Deneve Park in Bel Air. And uh, you can look up this postage stamp size park. I don't know how we played this game in there. But anyhow, we met at the... Uh, at UCLA at the Fisai, and then we caravaned over to the park, and pretty soon came Elvis, followed by three cars and all the guys, Red and Sonny and Alan Fortas, all wow. the, you know, all of his buddies, and and uh, we started playing this football game at this park, and I was just had just turned eighteen, and uh, you know, I, I I don't know, you know, I, I I'm not ashamed to say I was very impressed with the company we were keeping that day. Oh, and wow. we played in this game until it got too dark to continue because we were winning and Elvis didn't want to quit, you know, <laughs> and all the guys. And uh, off of that, Rick and I became friends. And uh, I started uh, working on, you know, I started visiting the set. And then Ozzy put me to work yeah. on the adventures of Ozzy and Harriet. And I was working background. And then one day he threw, uh, it, it's really not a line, it's, two words who's rick <laughs> in, a, in, a, in a show and that got me into the guild into the screen actors guild i had yeah. already joined the screen extras guild mm -hmm. and was doing work all over town working background and uh, you know that was the beginning of it and i uh, i did the role as kent for 
five years on the adventure, five seasons on the adventures of Ozzy and Harriet. Yeah. And during that period of time, football didn't work the way that I wanted it to. I had gone to the university. I had been pegged to go to the university of Southern California and I was a terrible student. And I had a, I, I came up short on a grade point average and wound up accepting a full ride to the university of Utah. Mm. And that was in 1960, spring of 62, I was up there. And uh, our red-white game got snowed out. I'm a Southern California kid, born and raised. Yeah. And we're, you know, in spring in April uh, with snow on the ground. <laughs> and I, I, I knew my wife and I were going to get married. Mm. And uh, it wasn't exactly a place that I wanted to uh, go the Married dorms at the University of Utah at that time were World War II Quonset huts. And I don't know if you know what a Quonset hut is or our audience out there. They may be too young to know, but they were corrugated steel, kind yeah. of round, you know, shaped things. And I just went, you know, snow, Quonset hut, wife, ah, this isn't happening. So I yeah. came back down and uh, transferred into the University of Southern California. Yeah. But by that point, I had been doing Ozzie and Harriet for a couple of years at that point. And yeah. uh, then when the thing, you know, didn't work out, I walked into Universal one day. I'd, I'd lost a lot of my football playing weight. And a guy who was in extra casting was moving up into new talent. And hmm. uh, he looked at me and he, he didn't recognize me as a matter of fact. <laughs> and I said, it's me, Bob, you have, you know. You're, you're. <laughs> then he went, listen, I'm going, would you consider testing for a, contract here. And I said, I love it. And so I did and was signed to uh, a long-term contract at Universal. Wound up staying there for 15 years. Yeah. So. <clears throat> and that'd do it. And yeah. you, uh, you, you talk about the, the extra work. I mean, uh, and, and when you were making those bones back in there, you, you were on the sets of like, like several of my favorite movies from that decade, seven oh. days of May, America's yeah. nation of Emily, the warlord. I mean, you yeah. you were out of some very diverse projects, so a lot of that must have right. been able to rub off on you. Yeah, no, there. You know that was people. We talk about this, and it's come up before. Those were some of the most enjoyable days that I've ever had in this business. You know, being on a set of Seven Days in May, where you've got Frederick March, and you've got. Edmund O'Brien and, you know, I mean, the, the Burt Lancaster and, you know, you know, you're working, you're there, you're watching these people who you grew up idolizing and some of the finest actors that the business has ever, ever had. And, and you're able there and you've got a kind of a goal and a thought in mind, you know, this, uh, I always knew at one point, once I started in the business, I was either going to be in front of the camera or behind the camera, but I was going to be in this business. And I rode, you know, we had a great, uh, when I started, I don't know if, if your audience is familiar with a man named Bill Fraker, but Bill Fraker was a cinematographer on Paint Your Wagon. He was a cinematographer on Bullet. He started out on Ozzy and Harriet. He was doing sticks, Mark, boom, and hit the sticks. And, and then he moved up to operator assistant and then operator and, and then to cinematographer and became one of the great cinematographers in our business. But I used to ride the camera and, you know, on rehearsals and stuff and operate the wheel. And I, and I thought, you know, this is the business is just a great business. I mean, you know, and, uh, you know, and then the, the thing happened where a bunch of my friends and we did like John Goldfarb, please come home. Uh, I wind up on the cover of of uh, Sports Illustrated with Red West, who was. Elvis's best friend and, yeah. and uh, you know, his protector when Elvis was at Humes High School. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, Red and I are on that. And we wind up on the cover of, of Sports Illustrated attempting to tackle Shirley MacLaine. And, and uh, you know, so you're, you're doing that. I did a lot of combats, played a lot of German soldiers on combat. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and you're on a lot like uh, MGM. Columbia, over at Universal, uh, you know, those those were still when the lots, you know, especially Universal. One time they had, I think, 20 shows shooting. Yeah. 
uh, for television, plus the movies. That, they, you know, that was the last, the well, last, the last, uh, last stage of the studio system. Really. Yeah, you know, and I became a beneficiary of 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 what had happened. Uh, you know, I, I I spent forty years either as a board member, an officer, or a committee member at the Screen Actors Guild. Yeah. And in 1960-61, uh, Bobby Kennedy's Justice Department sued Universal, sued MCA for a conflict of interest mm. uh, under the Taft, Taft, or not Taft-Hartley, but under uh, 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 the conflict laws, mm -hmm. because they were they were the producer of product, and they also owned an agency and had exclusive representation for people that they could put into this product. Yeah. And so they said they came to you, they went to MCA and they said, you either have to be a producer or an agency, make your choice. You can't be both. Hmm. So they chose to be a producer. They owned review studios. They then purchased universal. And, and interestingly, what happened was they reinstituted the old contract system. Yeah and started signing a lot of talent to exclusive deals. And then I became a beneficiary of that. Yeah. And, and uh, you know, while, while I had actually been making more money as, a, <laughs> as an extra, a background performer, than I was when I was under contract at Universal, it gave me the opportunity to make a clean break from, yeah. from working a, a, as extra and yeah. concentrate on acting. Yeah, and, 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 you know, I've I've always, you know, and that that comes to my uh, not regretted the the decision. And not um, and moving ahead, um, I'm not sure if it was your first appearance on Dragnet, but I think there was a. I, I think you, I think could it be fair to say your formal introduction to Jack Webb was when he told you how to properly enter the scene. Uh, my first my first encounter with Jack uh was in a uh pilot that jack did a two-hour movie of the week where there was a guy that was killing models mm. and and it was the thing to bring dragnet back but but again i i'm a young guy you know you know i was born in 1942 to give you you know so i'll be 80 at the end of september so to give you a timeline i grew up in a home without a television right we had a radio. Mm -hmm. We listened to Ozzy and Harriet. Yeah. We listened to Dragnet when it came on in 48. You know, I was, I'm six years old. And then those shows transitioned into television. Now, I'm, I'm out at Universal in 1966, I think it was when Jack was on the lot. And under contract, and he's doing the pilot, and a guy at Universal takes me over to meet Jack Webb, who in my house, with my mother especially, was a big deal. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, now, so now I'm meeting one of these guys, you know, and I'd been around uh, Ozzy Nelson, who was, you know, a genius. And Jack had the same kind of genius as Oz, but they were, they were two sides of the same coin. One never drank, never smoked, never cussed, Oz. The other one drank, smoked, and cussed <laughs> and yelled, and that was Jack. Yeah. Yeah. And so I go in to meet Jack Webb for the first time, and and I'm in, I'm in I'm studying, and I'm, we studied a particular exercise in cold reading. And Jack says, can you read? And I said, yeah, I've been trained to look at it. And, I, and, and he says, screw that stuff using another four letter word <laughs> yeah. and, and he throws a newspaper across his desk and he said, read the headline kid. So I read what, and I, and I wish to God I could remember what it was. I, I, I'd have it framed, yeah. but I, but I read the headline. He says, good kids, you can read, you got the job. <laughs> and, that, <laughs> and that led to me playing a hotel clerk in that two hour, uh, pilot that yeah. didn't air for another year and a half or something because they picked up the half hour mm -hmm. so that was the first time with, with jack yeah now the second time that happens and we got very i got very lucky 
I had been doing a show, uh, an episode of a show called Pistols and Petticoats <laughs> with a very abusive director. Mm. And at this point in my life, I was bouncing in a bar making more money than I was under contract at Universal. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I basically took no guff from nobody. <laughs> right. And, and and this old guy, he decides, you know, because I'm the low guy on the call sheet, he's going to he's going to put all of his lack of staying on schedule on my back. And he did some things. And I finally said, stop, old man. Nobody's talked to me like you. Are. Yeah. I'm, and you're not going to be the first. That reverberated all around the lot that that incident mm -hmm. had happened. And I went up to I went up to the guy who signed me the guy who had been an extra casting who said, would you test for it? And he goes, Jesus Christ, what'd you do to pistols and petticoats? I said, why would they say? He said, they said you ruined the show. I said, with seven lines. <laughs> <laughs> this was seven lines. And so now, now we fade and we, I'm working on dragnet for the first time playing a uniform police officer. Yeah. And, uh, and, Jack had a very short uh, wick, you know, and, and it, it, it is infamous. <laughs> yeah. And so, so I'm doing this thing where I walk up and I knock on a door and I say, Sergeant Friday. And he says, yeah, and I say officer, whatever my character name was. And, uh, and you're, you know, the APB on the suspect. Yeah. Well, I think we got him. Dun, 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 dun. And that's yeah. the, the kind of little sequence that goes on. So in the, in the setup, Ozzy, uh, Ozzy. Jack and Harry are at a table looking at a at, at a box of dynamite where dynamite is missing and there's a flag swastika pinned up on it and this is a neo-Nazi who's going to threaten to blow up a school. So they were at the table when I did the knock and Jack's, I said, Sergeant Friday and he says, yeah. And I say, I'm officer, so I'm working the detail down. So we get one in the can, and he asked the, the cameraman, was the kid on camera when he introduced himself? And the cameraman said, no. And Jack says, okay, this time, you know, when you knock on the door and you, and you say, Friday, wait till I get to you before you introduce yourself. And he says, that way I can cut in and get a close-up of your mug so your mother can see who you are. <laughs> you know? <And> so, <laughs> And we've done this thing now 10, 12 times. I mean, you know, and yeah. now I knock on the I knock on the door, Sergeant Friday, he says, Yeah. I say, I'm and, and he I do it the way we've done it 10 or 12 times. He yells, cut. And he goes, God damn it, kid. Get out there and use your head. And he's doing this. And I stepped on this porch back outside, stepped out, and I stood there and literally said to myself, Do I let this guy get away with this? Or do I rip him a new? Hmm. Yeah. And, and I went, <laughs> and I, and because of what had happened two weeks before, I went. I better keep my mouth shut. <laughs> I've got a wife <laughs> and a child, and I've got a contract, by the way. And uh, they're just liable to say I'm, I'm shouldn't be around people, <laughs> you know. So right. I kept my mouth shut. We did the close up, Jack. When we're doing the close up. Jack nudges Harry and says, the expletive kid is real, isn't he? And that was the instant that Jack fell in love with me. Yeah. Doing that. And that then led to everything else. He had a three character yeah. show written, which was <clears throat> big interrogation where I'm playing a rookie cop on, you know, yeah. working undercover and that whole thing. <clears throat> yeah. Anyhow, that, that was the sequence that led up to winding up in Adam 12. Bob mm -hmm. Senator, who created Adam 12 was researching the show at the time. Yeah. And so I was always going to be the rookie cop. And uh, and luckily enough that, uh, you know, interestingly, Bill Reynolds, who had been doing and had worked for Jack over at Warner Brothers and done a couple of things with Jack, uh, was doing the FBI with Ephraim Zimbalist. And, mm -hmm. and Jack wanted Bill to get out of that. This is all later I, I learned this stuff. And he, he couldn't. You know, he was on the FBI with Ephraim and Marty and Jack went all the way back to radio 
-hmm. And so, you know, it, it was my luck that I wound up with Marty. I'm sure, you know, I served with Bill on uh, at the Screen Actors Guild on, on, on the board of directors, and he's a nice, nice man. Yeah. And I'm sure we would have gotten along, but I was just the luckiest guy in the world to wind up with Martin Milner. Uh, I definitely think so. I mean, this, the show's legacy. Um, I think it was what – there was so much going on in America at the time, and I think it was a nice balance to audiences at the time. Like, oh, yeah. okay – Here's a nice show about police officers who rarely pull their guns. You know, it does happen, but it wasn't the modern type where it's bang, 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 yeah. and blood and guts. It was yeah. a lot of innocuous, silly things that uniformed police officers have to deal with. And well, the life. interesting, the interesting thing in the production of the show was that we had a grid, and it was you know episode one. You've got a liquor store hold up. You've got a car chase down into the wash. You've got uh, you know, what, whatever the other little incidents were. Uh, a woman who's going crazy because she thought a salamander got out of them, but whatever the thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, so those are the three incidents that go on there. And then you have a, a incident in the park. And, and so that would have been episode one. So they go, okay, we've done a liquor store hold up. So let's not do a liquor hold store hold up in episode two. Let's do a, you know, something. And so we had this grid going on. And what happened with the writers, where a writer would come in and say, you know, Reed's expect wife is expecting, and blah, blah, and we're gonna, and 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 they'd look and they'd say, okay, we haven't done anything interesting on uh, any stolen property or a, 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 a bank robbery or anything like that. They put the writer with a with a sergeant and go out and talk to police officers and come up with something interesting. Sure. Malloy and Reed could respond to. Yeah. And, and so, you know, that was the way that the show was produced. And one time Bob, uh, you know, had said we could have a shootout every show. I mean, it happens. It happens somewhere in America. There's a shootout and we could do a shootout every show. I was particularly in love and still am with the movie bullet mm -hmm. and Steve McQueen, Don Gordon in the whole tenor of the reality that bullet yeah. captured in for that era and if you if you are a fan of that movie there's an interesting thing that happens and it doesn't happen till steve mcqueen actually uses his gun it never comes out until that moment at, towards the end of the movie and you know so that was you know uh, you know the the thing and then marty and i spent a lot of time riding around i spent yeah in an ordinate number of hours uh, with a guy who was essentially assigned to me. I just yeah. call and say, I'm going to come out tonight and we go to roll call and yeah. check the car and I'd get in. And finally we had an incident between the pilot and the beginning of production of Adam 12, my house had been burgled and I caught one of the guys who was part of it and wound up in court and they said, we better get Ken out of the cars. <laughs> He's liable to be a witness to something that screws up the entire production schedule. So, uh, you know, it was, it was, uh, a, a real period of education, uh, yeah. for me on a personal level, but it was also the charm of what happened within the show itself and the public's look inside of a, inside of a car. You know, and, yeah. and as I've said from the beginning, and Bob Senator was the one who said it to me, this is a show about two guys in the black and white in the streets of Los Angeles doing what two guys in the black and white in the streets of Los Angeles would do. Yeah. End of story. And crime doesn't pay. Yeah. <laughs> you know, those are the, you know, the, the simplicity of Adam 12 uh, I, it was what it's, you know, its yeah. charm was. And I... Anyway, I you know, and I, and I, and it's, it's, it's still got a, a, a legacy to this day. Absolutely. Ah, and you've, you've had several, uh, really fun forays into science fiction in your career. Um, yeah. Galactica 1980 was not what we hoped for. And I know it was not what was promised to you, but Farscape, however, I think definitely made up for it. Well, you know, two things, Glenn Larson, I had known, from the days when he was a four prep. The first appearance that Ricky Nelson ever did in front of an audience was at a high school. And 
the, the preps were playing an assembly and they invited Rick to come to the, to the assembly and play. Yeah. And so they had been on Ozzy and Harriet doing vocals and they were back, background vocals and Bruce Bell and I just, you know, is still with us. And I saw, I haven't seen Bruce for a couple of years now. They appeared at a, at a, uh, car rally that Glendale, the city of Glendale here in California does yeah. every, every year and, uh, and has live music and everything. And the, and the new iteration of the preps were there and I yeah. got to visit with Bruce, but, uh, you know, the, um, so I knew Glenn. So Glenn called me one day and he said, we're going to do a show. It's called Galactica. And, uh, he said, I want, I want you to star in it. And I went over and met with Glenn at the office and we drove out to the model shop and everything and saw all the stuff that was being built. Yeah. And then we got into a, into a rather ugly issue between the studio and ABC. And I wound up not doing uh, the original Galactica. Yeah. And so then you know, the, the rumor, you know, the, the, <laughs> the discussion that was happening on the lot about over schedule and, you know, the cost of it and the whole thing was going on and, and, uh, uh, the original went down. Yeah. So now a couple of months or I can't remember what the time timing was. Uh, but Glenn calls me again and he says, we're going to, we're going to do, uh, Galactica again. This time we're going to find Earth and you're going to be the lead guy. I want you again. And uh, so, but you got to do me a favor. Yeah, I said, what is it? And he said, you've got to go over to the network and read. Hmm. And I hadn't read in 15 years. And for our audience who's out there, you know, these things are you know, walking into a room with a room full of people. And in this instance, this night that I did this at ABC, I walk into a room of people, there's a U-shaped couch and there's a bunch, there's a coffee table and a bunch of munchies on the coffee and everybody's doing everything, but paying attention to the actors. And I thought it was right. most disrespectful of what was going on, you know, but that's yeah. the whole bullshit of the casting issue. Yeah. And so, so finally, uh, the fellow actor who was in the room with me, they finally bring their attention to us and say, you know, you, you know, let's do the scene. And we did the scene. And so we now leave. And I get a call from my agent and say, and, and Glenn said, they will not cast somebody who hasn't read. So I, I, I've got to ask you to do me this favor. And I said, yeah, okay. And I do it now. They turn around, they hire a male model from another state. <laughs> and, and over this issue, I've left my agent. Mm -hmm. I, there were several things that were going on. This was basically the last <clears throat> thing that they could be commissionable on. And I wanted to change agents. Right. And so... I remember when she called and she said they went with this guy from and, uh, you know, so anyway, you didn't get it. And I went, you know, you, I hung up and I wrote the telegram for due cause and reason. I'm now dismissing you. And yeah. So now the next day or two days later, I wind up in who had been a friend and is now an agent. He was an agent and he had worked for another agent that I had had very early in my career, Lee Marvin's agent, a man named Meyer, Michigan. And, and, uh, and I wind up in my, in this other David's office and we're filling out all the papers. We fill out papers, sign, sealed. I got my copies. He's got his copies. He's on the phone. I just signed guy. You need to see him. We're going to set up meetings. We're going to, and David is working and the phone rings and it's my wife. And she says, Glenn Larson wants you to call him at the studio immediately. 
I'm like, okay, I, you know, hang the phone up. I look at David. What do we do? He says, well, let's call him. So I call Glenn. What's going on? Get over here. I've got a script and wardrobe. They're waiting for you. I said, I'm not leaving this office till we have a deal, Glenn. And he said, screw that. Let the agents and the business affairs guys do. And I said, no, you know, I'm not leaving this office. Yeah. And it was five o'clock. Yeah. Five o'clock in the evening. Mm -hmm. Friday. Five o'clock in the evening. I said, I, I'm, I've lost this thing twice. I am not going to lose it a third time. So we negotiated till nine o'clock. My new agent bested everything that the original deal had been. Everything. Yeah. And then I leave his office, drive over to Universal. I go in to war, into wardrobe and there's a script. And over in the corner of wardrobe are the guy that they hired from without reading and there are platform shoes that are about that big <laughs> just to give you and, and they've they've got barry van dyke who by the way is just a wonderful wonderful guy and again yeah. second time you know i, I you know lightning struck twice with big yeah people and, and people and so why we wind up wardrobe i have a 12-hour turnaround we're working the next day on saturday and we start working and it's going to be a two hour and we're working and working and working. And I had, I finally get the script read as we're shooting. And I said, Glenn, you know, this, the ending of this thing, you've got me laying flat on my back while an extra runs in and saves the world. <laughs> what are you doing? And he says, you know, I'll fix it. I'll fix it. And finally we uh, were continuing shooting and we're now turning a two hour into a three hour. Mm. I go into Glenn's office. I said, I know what you do. You start shooting and you won't let them off the hook until they say, well, you're picked up. Stop shooting. And yeah. now I said, we're, we're shooting the end tonight out at Van Nuys Airport. And he said, well, what about it? I said, you were going to change the thing. He said, well, what do you want? I said, it's not what I want. I just don't want to want knocked out, out cold while the bad guy gets away. Yeah. And he says, oh, OK. And he puts a piece of paper and it's very canalisk this instant. He puts a piece of paper in the, and he types the thing. He throws it out and he says, here, give this to the director. And I said, I'm not giving it to the director. You give it to the director. And and so he comes out and we've are, we're setting up the shot. And I said to the director, oh, didn't you get the change? And he said, what change? And I said, well, the, the, Glenn changed the scene. And, he, and the director got very upset. <laughs> Anyhow, it, that was about the best day of the entire experience of Galactic in 1980. Uh, you know, and, then the, and then Glenn begged them, don't pick us up. Let us develop scripts. Let us, you know, do it in September. No, if you, you know, we had started, I, the date was December 15th. Yeah. And they wanted the show. And they said, if you don't shoot it, then we're not going to, we're not going to pick it up. Right. And it just became this cycle. They put us yeah. on Monday night, seven o'clock, kids timing. Seven o'clock was <clears throat> given back to the networks by the FCC that it was supposed to be public information or news or, or kids program. Yeah. And then the whole network interference was just yeah, you know, you just pull your hair out. Because what Glenn wanted to do, and those who are who are familiar with probably the greatest sci-fi movie in the world, uh, the day the Earth stood still, yeah, uh, you know that's what Glenn was going to do. Yeah. So the Michael Rennie character, you know, coming to Earth, being you know integrating with the you know the with humanity in Earth on Earth, yeah. finding things, doing all that. There were glimpses of it that we got to, but at one point we were shooting three first units wow. simultaneously mm. on the same day, three yeah. first. <clears throat> and, you know, I, I hate to, uh, you know, it's, but it's an example of what occurred between Adam 12. We were always six, seven scripts ahead. 
Yeah. Now, after Adam 12 ended in 75, now we're on December 15th, 1979, we're shooting Galactica 1980, and we, we're no scripts ahead. We're, <laughs> we're pages ahead. Yeah. And we're getting things where uh, we've got a, a full set of the 747 at universal with background people sitting and doing all this yeah brought in given 12 pages be at this stage at this hour to shoot these 12 pages where you have no time to make the <clears throat> right real and all i did is kept going to glenn saying you know are you buying this crap <laughs> and he says no no it's fine Ken. You're, you know i do it better than I, just, I started to look at it the other day and i just turned it i just don't even it's one of the great opportunities that was missed and it ticks me off that it didn't work the way that it would and it was a yeah. good example of too many cooks in the kitchen yeah so, which then that's showbiz unfortunately for yeah. the good and the bad and the and the ill so yeah. and then we come down and you get sequest which was the team that created farscape yeah and, and uh, that's you know, yeah, and Sequest and Farscape and all, yeah. all that really good stuff. We're going to go to our audience questions. So thank you for indulging my capricious curiosity. Let's go ahead and roll this with And yeah, we'll get you back next time. Let's talk about Farscape and, and Sequest and all other fun stuff. And here's one from Andrew who wants to know, what would you say is your greatest accomplishment as an actor? And what does that mean to you today? Well, you know, it's, it's I think, obvious Adam-12. Uh, the longevity of Adam-12, the fact that... It, it, it puts the lie to the industry line that we really don't affect what happens with people. Mm -hmm. And it, and I say that because to this day, I have uh, people who, who chose being in the law enforcement profession because of Adam 12, Martin Milner, or Ken McCord. Yeah. And it's had the greatest influence uh, on my life. The other stuff that has has been fun and, you know, by no means, but the the lasting effect of a show like Adam 12 that still plays 10 days, 10 times a week. I mean, two episodes a day for five days a week on, I think it's still on me TV. Yeah. Uh, I don't get that channel, but, uh, you know, to this day that still influences people, you know, is something that, that, Marty and I were very proud of. We were proud of the fact that it changed a lot of perception by the public about what a law enforcement officer is. Changed a lot of law enforcement officers. Had a guy come up to me one time thanking me. And I said, for what? And he said, well, for the show. He said, I, I, the way I was doing the job, sooner or later, I was going to get killed. And he said, I started emulating the way you do the job. And I just wanted to thank you. Probably saved my life. Wow. And we had we had instances where when the show started right after it debuted, uh, and these are things that stuck in my mind and, and made the show so much more to me and to Marty. Uh, two guys in black and white stopped by and they they said, We've been watching the show, it's you know, we love it, you know, but you're really putting the pressure on us. <laughs> said, Why? And they said, We have to live up to your image. I said, good, <laughs> you know, stuff like that. And the fact yeah. that, and the fact that uh, uh, the other thing that stuck was a guy who came and said, I can, I can mark pre Adam 12, post Adam 12, pre Adam 12, kids never came up and talked to us post Adam 12 kids are coming up to us now, wow. you know, and they're interested in what we do. And it would, you know, and those kinds of things, you know, so I have to say that that's probably, uh, you know, the greatest, uh, you know, my achievement as an actor that I've yeah. been a part of. Absolutely. Absolutely. Andrew, great question. Thank you for starting us off with that. And what do we have next from Dido? Uh, were there a lot of on the sh set shenanigans during the, the of airplane? Two? Of air well, you know, not so much on airplane two, uh, a lot on Adam 12. Okay. <laughs> Marty and I had a great time. We had more fun than any two human beings should be allowed to have. And, uh, you know, so, but, you know, Airplane 2, Bob Hayes is a great friend of mine. I'm godfather to his son, oh. Jake. And, uh, you know, and Bob and I are, are are very, very close. And so, you know, 
we had we, that friendship came out of there. Fun working with Peter Graves. Yeah. Uh, the uh, you know, there's an interesting story. This is this is a this is a let me show this. This is a picture of my wife, probably as a sophomore in high school, who was dating a friend of mine. And one night, I'm 15, and a bunch of guys, we decide we're going to go to the Hollywood Christmas Parade. And we crash the green room where all the celebrities are yeah. that are on the floats and in the cars and everything on sure. the, Christmas, the Hollywood Christmas Parade. Yeah. And we get found out by a woman who comes over and says, I, you, you boys don't belong here. You have to leave. And we're sitting next to a man. And I'll see if you can, if you can bring this up. Do, can, do you see whose autograph this is? That's Jim Backus? No. Oh. James Arness. Okay. All right. <laughs> you know, and, and so, so, uh, Stuart gets Jim Arness's autograph on the back of my wife's picture. <laughs> and I get Jane Mansfield's on my student body card. And it's a heck of a body to have in your student body. Yes. <laughs> and so, so Arness, when he hears this woman say, you boys have to leave, he says, these boys are with me. And, and the, you know, and we were allowed to stay. Now, the thing that I, that is so idiotic of me, two things, Peter Graves is Jim's brother. Yeah. Peter Graves and I worked together twice. I did a run for your life with Peter and I did airplane two with Peter sitting next to him. Jim Arness and I had the same dentist. <laughs> One day we're in the dentist's office together in the waiting room and exchanging hellos. And I forget all about this incident, which just, it, I kicked myself in the butt and I was reminded of this because when my friend passed away, his widow sent a whole bunch of stuff that he had kept. And that's how I wound up with this, this picture and his autograph again. So, you know, th those kind of things. And, and I, and I, I chalk it up to, you know, like with Andy Duggan on seven days in May, yeah. I do a pilot called Pine Canyon's Burning, Pine Canyon that was going to be a series. I take over a, a brush station in the northern part of L.A. County from Andrew. And I forgot to say, hey, we worked on seven days in May. <laughs> you know? yeah. And so, but I chalk it up to, uh, uh, I was back in, in, uh, in Indiana and went by James Dean's house and spoke with James Dean's cousin, Marcus Winslow. And I signed on to a newsletter that is at the James Dean Museum and, and uh, stuff, and I get a newsletter. And, and when Marty died, there's a column of actors who worked with James Dean. Hmm. And they've got Martin Milner, who worked on the Stu Irwin show with James Dean. Well, Marty and I were as close as two human beings could be. Our families were like this. We, you know, we spent time away from Adam. We were on the road together. We were yeah. doing conventions and doing <clears throat> appearances all over the country. Never mentioned that he had worked with James Dean. <laughs> and I went and when, when I saw that thing, I said, isn't that uh, unbelievable? And then I looked the thing up on YouTube. The, the scene yeah. and I chalk it up to just like, you know, you, you're working a day or two or whatever. And this young actor, Marty played uh, the boyfriend of on the Stuart Owens show of the, of Stuart Owens daughter. And, and James Dean had to have been an actor who came in for a day, did a day mm -hmm. work and left. And Marty probably just didn't <laughs> think James Dean. You know, yeah, <laughs> exactly. He was doing day work, you know? Yeah. Day. But the legend. I think again, everybody's ours. Yeah. Uh, Ditto. Great question. Thank you. I think we have time for one more. See if we go on a really fun one. And this is going to come from Jody. 
if you wanted to be a contestant on a game show, past or present, what would you have liked to have been on? Well, I, I loved uh, well, game show. I loved uh, Hollywood Squares. Also loved doing laugh in. Marty and I did laugh in. Look up on YouTube, all of you. That's right. Yeah. You know the laugh in stuff there. So, or or as my wife and I did during the pandemic, all of them are available on IMDb TV. I think all of the 144. And so we started doing things. I realized that uh, that we really never saw laugh in because it was at the same time we were doing Adam 12. Laugh in was on Tuesday nights at like 10 o'clock. And I was always in bed because I had to be up at five to be at the studio. So yeah. I look at them and I go, whoa, these are funny as all get out. And I hadn't really seen them. So we watched all 144 episodes in sequence over a, a month and a half or whatever yeah. during the pandemic, when mm -hmm. especially when we were sequestered here at home. But I, I love doing Hollywood Squares. And I did a lot of Hollywood Squares. And it was the ideal game show, especially for having uh you know uh celebrity guests you know the fun with with people like vincent price and with paul lind and you know, yeah. all of the all of the people you know so yeah. that, that i wish you know they tried to revive it marty and i did it when they did the revision of it uh it's you know it's kind of like trying to catch lightning it's hard to do a second time uh, Henry Wrangler owns the rights to it now, and yes, he's been and he's been, I, uh, and every time we have him on, it's just like uh, Hollywood Squares. Like, oh, Patty, I'm trying. I, I was at a meeting yeah. last week. or trying to bring it back, you know. And so yeah, it's yeah. The thing is, it was you know you'd never again you you know people like me would hardly ever wind up on it, but uh, you know they'd have everybody up. But it is a fun show to you know to be a participant in because you've got the question and answer. You can never recreate that center square with Paul Lind. I mean, he, yeah, one of a kind. <laughs> yeah, to say the least. I yeah. uh, say, say the least. Uh, those were the days. Uh, Jody, thank you. Great question. Kent, this has been an absolute blast. Any thank final you. words before we take our leave? Well, I want to thank everybody who's on this call, and I hope everybody stayed safe during the pandemic. Keep looking at, at schedules. I, I, Turned down a lot of personal appearances, but hope to get back at doing it. I know that everybody's becoming more adept at keeping everyone safe at those live events. Yes. And uh, I, I'm looking at my comfort level, uh, number one, but hope Absolutely. to be doing it uh, again soon. But until the meantime, these things are fun to do. And thank you very much for being a part of it. Uh, uh, Ken, it's been my absolute pleasure to serve you once again. Thank you for joining us here on the GalaxyCon virtual stage. Thank you to our audience for joining us, and thank you for your great questions. Hope to see everybody again soon. Until then, bye-bye, take care, and remember, smiles are free, so spend them often. <laughs>